Chapter 30, Health Assessment and Physical Examination. Nurses need to be able to recognize and interpret each patient's behavioral and physical presentation. The complete health assessment involves a nursing history, as well as a behavioral and a physical examination. The health history interview is where the nurse will gather subjective data about a patient's condition. The objective data is obtained while observing a patient's behavior as well as the overall presentation of the behavior. An uh, other objective data is the head to toe body system review. The nurse will make clinical judgments based on all of the gathered data to create a plan of care for each patient situation. The nurse needs to consider the patient's health beliefs, use of alternative therapies, the nutritional habits, relationships with family, and the comfort with physical closeness during the examination and history. The nurse needs to be culturally aware and avoid stereotyping based on gender, race, education, or any cultural factors. When meeting a patient for the first time, it is important to establish a baseline assessment that will enable a nurse to refer back to physiological outcomes of care, the normal range of physical findings, a pattern of findings identified when the patient is first assessed, clinical judgments made about a patient's changing health status. The answer is C. Baseline assessment findings are a pattern of findings identified from the patient is first assessed. Baseline assessment findings reflect a patient's functional abilities and serve as the basis for comparison with subsequent assessment findings. After reading through the case study, what is the initial step in Jane's assessment of Mr. Neal? The initial step in the assessment process is to prepare for the examination. The physical examination is a routine and an integral part of the nurse's patient assessment. In many care settings, a head to toe assessment is required daily. The nurse performs the, the reassessment when a patient condition changes as it either improves or declines. There are specific supplies that a, nurse, that a nurse needs for the physical assessment. Drapes or a cover, an eye chart, routinely the Snellen eye chart, a flashlight or a pen light, physical forms, non latex exam gloves, a gown for the patient, a percussion hammer or a reflex hammer, pulse oximeter, scale with the height measurement rod, sphygmomanometer and cuff, stethoscope, a tape measure, thermometer, and a watch with a second hand. These are various positions for patients that need to be understood in the Foundations of Nursing course. A head to toe assessment includes all the body systems and the nurse recalls and performs each step in a predetermined order. For an adult, the examination begins with an assessment of the head and neck 
and progresses in a methodical way down the body to incorporate all the body systems. For inspection, the nurse will look, listen, and smell to distinguish normal from abnormal findings. This occurs when interacting with the patient, watching for nonverbal expressions of emotional and mental status, and, and assessing physical movements and structural components. This is a deliberate, um, deliberate method and the nurse needs to pay attention to detail. Palpation is using the sense of touch to gather information. Through the sense of touch, the nurse will make judgments about expected and unexpected findings of the skin or underlying tissue, muscle, and bones. The palmar surface of the hand and the finger pads are more sensitive and used to determine position, texture, size, consistency, massage, fluid, and crepitus. The body temperature will be assessed by using the dorsal surface or the back of the hand. Vibration is felt best using the palmar surface of the hand and fingers. For inspection, refer to table 30.4 in your textbook. When the nurse inspects, we want to make sure that we are looking at bilateral sides to consider the, the shape, the size, the color, the symmetry, and the positioning always looking for any abnormalities. All the findings should be validated with the patient. Palpation is using the sense of touch to gather important data related to the patient. We want to make sure that the fingernails are kept short. In the photos at the bottom, A is a radial pulse that is detected with the pads of the fingertips, which is the most sensitive part of the hand. The dorsum of the hand in B will help detect temperature variations in the skin. The bony part of the palm at the base of the fingers helps detect vibrations. In A, during light palpation, gentle pressure is applied against the underlying skin and tissues that can help detect areas of irregularities and tenderness. When performing palpation, the nurse should express to the patient, if you feel any pain or tenderness, please let me know. In B, if this is deep palpation, this depresses tissue to assess the condition of underlying organs. The general nurse does not use deep palpation when assessing a patient. They will use the light palpation, which is a centimeter or less in depth. Percussion used to determine various organs and make a judgment call on the organs, uses the fingers and the knuckles where the nurse will tap on a knuckle to listen for specific sounds. Depending on the sound will help determine where the individual has the hand place and what is lying beneath the skin surface. Nurses need to be aware of infection control because harmful bacteria like gram positive bacilli, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, um, methicillin sen sensitive Staphylococcus aureus 
These can be transferred from patient to patient when reusing portable equipment like a stethoscope. The stethoscope needs to be cleaned between each patient, including the diaphragm and the bell. Using something like um, isopropyl alcohol prep pads or hand foam cleaners will help cleanse the equipment before the next patient. The earpieces of the stethoscope are a great sources for transferring bacteria. When an individual will touch their ears and then care for the patient, potential pathogens could contaminate the earpieces. Through using hand hygiene before and after patient contact will decrease the risk of transmitting microorganisms from the nurse's ear to the patient. Frequency is the number of sound waves that are generated per second by a vibrating object. The higher the frequency, the higher the pitch of a sound. Loudness is an amplitude of the sound wave. Auscultated sounds can range from soft to loud. Quality refers to sounds of similar frequency and loudness from different sources. Terms that might be used are blowing or gurgling to describe the quality of a sound. Duration is the length of time that the sound vibrations last. The duration of sound is short, medium, or long. Layers of soft tissue will dampen the duration of sounds from deep internal organs. When first visiting with the patient, the nurse should note the overall appearance as well as the patient's behavior. Note their gender, any signs of distress that they may be having, their posture, their gait, their hygiene, their mood, their speech patterns. At this time, vital signs will be obtained as well as a height and weight measurements. Normal skin pigmentation will range in tone from ivory or light pink to ruddy pink in light complexion and from light to deep brown or olive in dark complexion. Various terminology or characteristics of skin should be known. Cyanosis is a bluish tinge. This indicates an increased amount of deoxygenated hemoglobin. This is associated with hypoxia. Pallor is a decrease in color. This indicates the reduced amount of oxyhemoglobin. Loss of pigmentation is vertiglo. Jaundice is a yellow orange cast, indicates an increase in the deposit of bilirubin in tissues. Erythema or red indicates an increased visibility of the oxyhemoglobin that is caused by dilation or increased blood flow. Tan or brown indicates an increased amount of melanin. Moisture is the amount of hydration of the skin and mucous membranes. This helps to determine the, any body fluid imbalances, any changes in the environment of the skin, and the regulation of body temperature. Moisture can refer to wetness or oiliness. Normal skin is routinely smooth and dry. Temperature depends on the amount of blood circulating through the dermal layer. Increased or decreased skin temperature indica indicates an increase or a decrease in the blood flow. 
texture is normally smooth, soft, even, and flexible. flexible. Turgor is the elasticity of the skin. Normal skin will lift easily and fall back immediately to its resting position. Vascularity is the circulation of the skin. This affects the color in localized areas and leads to the appearance of superficial blood vessels. Edema are areas of the skin that are swollen or edematous from a buildup of fluid in the tissues. Lesions, this is a broad term that refers to any unusual finding on the skin surface. Normal skin is free of lesions, except for common freckles or age-related changes, like skin tags, senile keratosis, cherry angiomas, or atrophic warts. To assess skin turgor, you should pinch the skin and pull it up. This will indicate to you whether or not the patient is dehydrated. If the skin stays in a tenting position, that indicates dehydration. If the skin returns to normal, this will indicate no dehydration. One area of skin that is good to assess for turgor is on the clavicle or the back of the hand. To assess for pitting edema, routinely this is on the lower extremities like the calves, Press on the skin and watch to see if the skin bounces back and returns to normal. If the skin keeps the depression, depending on the depth of the, depth of the pressing that the nurse has accomplished, will determine how deep or the grade for the pitting edema. A patient complains of thirst and headache. The patient appears emaciated. Upon initial examination, you find that the skin does not return to normal shape. This finding is consistent with pallor, edema, erythema, poor skin turgor. The answer is D poor skin turgor. When performing a physical assessment, the nurse will first begin with the head, put on exam gloves, and examine through the patient's hair, looking for any type of infestations. The photo indicates head lice. The nurse will also note the color, the amount of distribution, as well as the thickness and texture of the head, they will palpate the scalp, noting any bumps or lesions. They will also inspect the fingernails to ensure that they are the appropriate shape for a patient. When the nurse looks at the fingernails, they should be smooth and rounded with a moon at the base of the fingernail. There should not be any lines, any clubbing, any pitting in the nails. These are abnormal findings. At this time, the nurse will also press on the fingernail to blanch it. This is looking at capillary refill. The nail should return the coloring in less than three seconds to be considered normal. When beginning with the patient's head, a skull is routinely round with prominences in the frontal area 
and in the occipital area posteriorly. A skull that has no lumps or bumps and is within normal range is considered normocephalic. The examination of the eyes includes assessing the visual acuity, the visual fields, the extraocular movements, as well as the external and the internal eye structures. The assessment of distance vision requires a Snellen chart. The Snellen chart is a standardized set of letters with standardized numbers at the end of each line of the chart. The numerator, or the top number, is the number 20, which is the distance the patient stands from the chart. The denominator, which is the distance from which the normal eye is able to read the chart, is the bottom number. Normal visual acuity is 2020. The nurse will record visual acuity for each eye individually and both eyes and include in the, in the documentation whether the test was performed with or without correction, which would include glasses or contact lenses. In the figure, the lacrimal duct in the corner of the eye secretes and drains tears, which help to moisten and lubricate the eye structure. The cardinal fields of gaze is where the nurse will assess extraocular movements. The patient will look straight ahead and follow the nurse when the nurse raises a pen or their finger around the patient's eye, the patient is only moving their eyes and not their head. Nystigmus is a term that indicates an involuntary rhythmical oscillation of the eyes. This can occur due to a result of an injury to the eye muscles and the supporting structures or a disorder of the cranial nerves that innervate the muscle. With the eyes, when looking at the two photos, the top photo is a fundus of a Caucasian patient. The bottom photo is a fundus of an African American patient. The term PERLA P-E-R-R-L-A indicates that pupils are equal, round, and reactive to light accommodation. To determine accommodation, you will ask the patient to gaze at a far distant object, for example, a wall. And then you will test the patient with a finger or a pencil held approximately 10 centimeters from the bridge of the nose. The pupils will routinely converge and accommodate by constricting when looking at close objects. The pupillary responses should be equal. Testing for accommodation is important to determine if the patient has a defect in the pupillary response to light. If the assessment of pupillary reaction is normal in all the tests, you may use the term or the abbreviation PERLA, which stands for pupils equal, round, and reactive to light and accommodation. When examining an ear, the nurse will look at the external ear they will look at the patient straight on and determine if the ears are the same size and if the ears match as far as length. When we are looking in an ear or providing medications, we need to make sure 
that the ear canal is straightened. For an adult and an older child, we will pull the auricle of the ear up and backward to straighten the ear canal. For an infant, the auricle should be pulled down and back to straighten the ear canal. Normal cerumen or earwax is dry, usually light brown to gray in color and flaky, or it may be moist and dark yellow or brown in color and sticky. The image shown is a normal right tympanic membrane. If you notice at the bottom, there is a cone of light. For a right ear, the cone of light is at five o'clock. For a left ear, the cone of light is at seven o'clock. A normal tympanic membrane should be translucent, shiny, and pearly gray. It does not have any tears or breaks. There are three types of hearing loss for individuals. They are conduction, sensory neural, and mixed. Conduction loss will interrupt sound waves as they travel from the outer ear to the cochlea of the inner ear because the sound waves are not transmitted through the outer and middle ear structures. Causes of conduction loss would be due to swelling of the auditory canal or tears in the tymp tympanic membrane. Sensory neural loss involves the inner ear, auditory nerve, or hearing center of the brain. Sound is routinely conducted through the outer and middle ear structures, but the continued transmission of sound will become interrupted at some point beyond the bony ossicles. Mixed loss involves a combination of conduction and sensory neural loss. A tuning fork permits the comparison of hearing by bone conduction with that of air conduction. For the nose and the sinuses, the nurse will use inspection and palpation to inspect the integrity of the nose as well as the sinuses. For the external nose, one should observe for shape, size, skin color, and the presence of any deformities or inflammation. The nose is routinely smooth and symmetrical with the same coloring as the face. The nurse should note any tenderness or masses or any deviations upon palpation. Internal, no, internally in the nose is mucosa. All mucosa is normally pink and moist without any lesions. The lips are routinely symmetrical, smooth, moist, and pink in color. The nurse needs to inspect the teeth to determine the quality of the dental hygiene. Routinely, healthy teeth are smooth, white, and shiny. Normal oral mucosa is glistening, pink, smooth, and, and moist. Healthy gums are mucosa, these should be pink, smooth, moist, and fit tightly around each tooth. Routinely, there is no tenderness in the mouth. The normal tongue is medium or dull red in color, moist, slightly rough on the top of surface, and smooth along the lateral margins. The soft palate extends posteriorly toward the pharynx. It is routinely light pink and smooth. Placing the tongue depressor on the posterior tongue elicits the gag reflex and permits the nurse to determine if the reflex is, 
is appropriate. Normal pharyngeal tissues are pink and smooth, moist, indicating good hydration. In the neck, note the triangles formed by the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the lower jaw, and the anterior neck anteriorly, and the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the trapezius muscle, and the lower neck posteriorly. Normally, the thyroid is not visible. There are many lymph nodes in the neck and head area, as well as in various places in the body. The nurse needs to palpate the lymph nodes for edema, erythema, or red streaks. Normally, lymph nodes are not visible and they are not easily palpable and should not be tender or sore. The normal chest contour is symmetrical with the anterior posterior diameter one third to one half of the traverse or side to side diameter. The normal spine is straight without lateral deviation. Routinely, there is no bulging or active movement that occurs within the intercostal spaces during breathing. Bulging of the intercostal spaces indicates that a patient is using great effort to breathe. The image in A is the anterior position, B is the lateral position, and C is the posterior position. This shows the structures of the lungs as well as the rib cage. This is the posterior thorax. Note in A the hand position that is used for palpation of the posterior thorax excursion. In B, as the patient inhales, the, notice the movement of the chest excursion separates the thumbs. To determine tactile fremitus, ask the patient to say 99 or 111. At this time, the nurse will palpate both sides simultaneously and symmetrically from top to bottom for comparison using one hand quickly um, noting both symmetrical sides. Routinely, a faint vibration is present as the patient speaks. If the fremitus is faint, ask the patient to speak in a louder or lower tone of voice. Normal fremitus should be symmetrical. Vibrations are strongest at the top and near the level of the tracheal bifurcation. In A, this is a systematic pattern, posterior, lateral and then anterior view that is followed by palpating and auscultating the thorax. The use of auscultation is to assess the movement of air through the tracheobronchial tree to detect mucus or obstructed airways. Normal air flows through the airways in an unobstructed pattern. Recognizing the sounds created by normal airflow allows the nurse to detect sounds caused by airway obstruction. The nurse will auscultate for normal breath sounds and abnormal or adventitious sounds. Crackles are high-pitched fine, short, interrupted crackling sounds that can be heard on the end of inspiration and usually are not cleared with coughing. Medium crackles are lower, moister sounds heard during middle of inspiration 
and also not cleared with coughing. Coarse crackles are loud bubbling sounds heard during inspiration and again are not cleared with coughing. Ronchi are loud, loud low-pitched rumbling coarse sounds that are heard either during inspiration or expiration. And sometimes these may be cleared with coughing. Wheezes are high pitched, continuous musical sounds, like a squeak heard continuously during inspiration or expiration. Routinely, wheezes are louder on expiration. A pleural friction rub is a dry rubbing or grating quality sound that is heard during inspiration or expiration. This does not clear with coughing, and it is heard loudest over the lower lateral anterior surface. Viewing this slide, you can see on the left-hand side an indication of sounds that you may hear when a patient is ill. On the right-hand side, when the patient is not ill, these will indicate to you the sounds that should be heard throughout the lung fields. A patient is admitted with pneumonia. When auscultating the patient's chest, you hear low-pitched, continuous sounds over the bronchi. These sounds are labeled as crackles, ronchi, wheezes, or pleural rub? The answer is B. Ronchi are loud, low-pitched, rumbling, coarse sounds that are heard either during inspiration or expiration and may be cleared sometimes by coughing. Ronchi are routinely caused by muscular spasms fluid or mucus in larger airways. A new growth or external pressure may cause turbulence. The nurse needs to understand routine or normal breath sounds. Vesicular sounds are soft, breezy, and low pitched. The inspiratory phase is three times longer than the expiratory phase throughout the lung. The bronchovesicular sounds are blowing sounds that are medium pitched and of medium intensity. The inspiratory phase is equal to the expiratory phase. Bronchial sounds are loud and high pitched with hollow quality. The expiration lasts longer than the inspiration. The bronchial sounds are heard over the trachea. What patient teaching strategies might be used in regards to Mr. Neal smoking? The nurse would explain the risk factors for chronic lung disease and lung cancer, which would be cigarette smoking, history of smoking for more than 20 years, exposure to environmental pollution, and radiation exposure from occupational, medical, and environmental sources. Exposure to residential radon and asbestos will increase the risk, especially in smokers. Other risk factors may include certain metals like arsenic, cadmium, some organic chemicals, and tuberculosis. Another risk factor is exposure to secondhand smoke. For education purposes, the nurse should share brochures on lung cancer from the American Cancer Society with the patient and family. The nurse should discuss with the patient the warning signs of lung cancer, like a persistent cough, blood streaked sputum, chest pains, and recurrent attacks of pneumonia or bronchitis. The nurse should counsel the patient along with the spouse on the benefits of receiving influenza and pneumonia vaccines. 
because of the greater susceptibility to a respiratory infection. If the patient has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the nurse should educate the patient in coughing and pursed lip breathing techniques. Individuals that are at risk for tuberculosis should be referred to clinics or healthcare centers for TB skin testing. The apex of the heart touches the anterior chest wall at approximately the fifth intercostal space, just medial to the left midclavicular line. This is known as the apical pulse point or the point of maximum impulse, the PMI. The image indicates a cardiac cycle. Note the AVC or when the aortic valve closes, the AVO or when the aortic valve opens. This can be measured with an EKG or an electrocardiogram. The MVC is the mitral valve closure and the MVO is when the mitral valve opens. The heart routinely pumps blood through its four chambers in a methodical, even sequence. Events on the left side of the heart occur just before those on the right side. As blood flows through each chamber, the valves open and close, the pressures within the chambers rise and fall, and the chambers will contract. There are two phases to the cardiac cycle, systole and diastole. In, systoles, in systole, the, ventric, the ventricles will contract and eject blood from the left ventricle into the aorta and from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery. In diastole, the ventricles will relax and the atria will contract to move blood into the ventricles and fill the coronary arteries. The closure of the mitral and the tricuspid valves causes the first heart sound, known as S1, and often described as a lub. The ventricles will then contract and the blood will flow through the aortic and pulmonary valves into the circulation. After the ventricles empty, the ventricular pressure falls below that in the aorta and the pulmonary artery. The aorta and the pulmon pulmonic valves close, causing the second heart sound, known as S2, or the dub. This image shows the anatomical sites for the assessment of cardiac functioning. Each site on the heart is where a valve is internally. The nurse, when inspecting the heart, should listen to each area to determine cardiac functioning. As a student, it should be understood and known where each placement is to listen for the valves. For the heart, there are six anatomical landmarks of the heart that need to be inspected and palpated. The nurse will look for the appearance of pulsations, viewing each area over the chest at an angle to the side. Routinely, there will not be any pulsations seen except for maybe at the, pul the pulse or PMI in thin patients or at the epigastric area as a result of an abdominal aorta pulsation. The nurse will listen for the complete cycle, which is a lub-dub of the heart sounds clearly at each location. This should be repeated for each site with the bell of the stethoscope. A thrill is a continuous palpable sensation 
that resembles the purring of a cat. The intensity is recording using the following grades. Grade one is barely audible in a quiet room. Grade two is quiet, but clearly audible. Grade three is moderately loud. Grade four is loud with associated thrill. Grade five is very loud. The thrill is easily palpable. And grade six is very loud, audible with the stethoscope, not in contact with the chest. The thrill is palpable and visible. A murmur is a low, medium, or high sound in pitch, depending on the velocity of the blood that's flowing through the valves. A low-pitched murmur is best heard with the bell of the stethoscope. If the murmur is best heard with the diaphragm of the stethoscope, it is high-pitched. Note the anatomical position of the carotid artery. The examination of the vascular system includes measuring the blood pressure and assessing the integrity of the peripheral vascular system. The nurse will use skills of inspection, palpation, and auscultation. The carotid artery supplies oxygenated blood to the head and neck. The nurse should examine one carotid artery at a time. If the nurse occludes both arteries simultaneously during palpation, the patient will lose consciousness as a result of inadequate circulation to the brain. The carotid artery should not be palpated or massaged vigor vigorously because the carotid sinus is located at the bifurcation of the common carotid artery in the upper third of the neck. This sinus, carotid sinus will send impulses along the vagus nerve. Stimulating the vagus nerve will cause a reflex drop in heart rate and blood pressure, which can promote syncope or cardiac arrest for the patient. This is a very um, important issue to note for older adults. The normal carotid artery pulse is localized and strong. It will have a thrusting quality. There should be an equalness between left and right carotid arteries in pulse rate, rhythm, and strength, and equal are um, bilaterally elastic. This demonstrates the auscultation for a carotid artery brewery. Carotid is the most commonly auscultated pulse. Auscultation is especially important for middle-aged or older adults or individuals suspected of having cerebrovascular disease. When the lumen of a blood vessel is narrowed, as shown in the image below, it will disturb blood flow. As blood passes through the narrowed section, it creates a turbulence causing a blowing or a swishing sound. The artery should be palpated lightly for a thrill, which is a palpable brewery, if you can hear a brewery in the carotid artery. This image demonstrates the position of a patient to assess jugular vein distension, commonly known as JVD. The internal jugular vein lies deeper along the carotid artery. The column of blood inside the internal jugular vein serves as a manometer and reflects the pressure in the right atrium. The higher the column, the greater the venous pressure. The raised venous pressure reflects right-sided heart failure. For routine vital signs, 
This will include the assessment of the rate and rhythm of the radial artery. As a nursing student, you will count the radial artery pulsations for 30 seconds and multiply by two. If the pulse is irregular, the nurse should always count for 60 seconds. We as nurses measure all peripheral arteries for equality and symmetry. We compare the left pulse with the right pulse simultaneously on all peripheral pulses except for the carotid artery. A lack of symmetry between bilateral sides indicates impaired circulation. Image A indicates the positioning of the brachial, radial, and the ulnar arteries. B is a palpation of the radial pulse, which is routinely used when assessing vital signs. C is a palpation of the ulnar pulse, and D is the palpation of the brachial pulse. When taking someone's pulse, we only use the fingertips. We do not use our thumb. The reason for that is the thumb has a pulse of its own, and we do not want to misinterpret the patient's pulse rate. When considering the lower extremities, the nurse will inspect for changes in color, temperature, and condition of the skin. This can indicate either arterial or venous alterations or issues. We will ask the patient if they have any pain in their legs. If an arterial occlusion is present, the patient will experience pain distal to the occlusion. When noting an occlusion, as a nurse, we understand the five P's. They are pain, pallor, lack of color, pulselessness, no pulses distally to, to the obstruction, paresthesia, and paralysis. When noting the images, A shows the anatomical positioning of femoral, popliteal, dorsalis pedal, and posterior tibial arteries. B shows the palpation of the femoral pulse. C is the palpation of the popliteal pulse. D is the palpation of the dorsalis pedis pulse. And E is the palpation of the posterior tibial pulse. If a pulse is difficult to palpate, the nurse can use an ultrasound stethoscope, also known as a Doppler, to amplify the sounds of the pulse wave. Factors that may weaken a pulse or make palpation difficult would include obesity, a reduction in stroke volume of the heart, diminished blood volume, or arterial obstruction. This image is the ultrasound stethoscope or the Doppler in position for the dorsalis pedis artery. This is the table in your textbook 30.25. These describe the various signs of either venous or arterial insufficiency. Note the changes between the color, the temperature, the pulse, the edema, or skin changes. This indicates to the nurse whether it is a venous insufficiency or an arterial insufficiency. Remember, the venous system returns blood to the heart. The arterial system takes blood to the periphery away from the heart. Superficial and deep lymph nodes drain the legs, 
but only two groups of superficial nodes are palpable. Superficial inguinal nodes in the groin area are toward the inner thigh. In the upper extremities, the nurse can palpate the epitrochlear nodes, which is the medial aspect of the arms near the antecubital fossa. The proximal part is located in the axilla and is usually assessed during the examination of the breasts. A shows the lymphatic drainage for lower extremities and B shows the lymphatic drainage for upper extremities. It is important to examine the breast tissue of both female and male patients. Men routinely have a small amount of glandular tissue in the breast which is a potential site for the growth of cancerous cells, depending on heredity. In contrast, the majority of the female breast tissue is glandular tissue. The image depicts the quadrants of the left breast and the auxiliary tail of Spence. When Examining the breast, we need to observe contour or shape of the breast and note any masses, flattening, retraction, or dimpling. The skin needs inspected for color, venous pattern, and presence of lesions, edema, or inflammation. The nipple and areola need to be inspected for size, color, shape, discharge, and direction in which the nipple points. A normal areola is round or oval in shape and nearly equal bilaterally. The American Cancer Society has guidelines for early detection of breast cancer in women that are at average risk. The society recommends that women who are at high risk based on certain factors should get an MRI and a mammogram every year. Women at high risk are those that have a lifetime risk of breast cancer of about 20 to 25% or greater based mainly on family history. They may have a known BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutation have a first degree relative, which would be a parent, brother, sister, or child with BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene mutation and have not had genetic testing themselves, or they had radiation to the chest and they were between the ages of 10 to 30 years old. As a nurse, we need to educate individuals on self-breast examination. The patient must choose to perform the self-breast examination and assess the method cho chosen when they do the examination. If it's a female, it will be in relation to the menstrual cycle. The best time for this breast self-examination for a female is the fourth through the seventh day of the menstrual cycle or right after the menstrual cycle ends, when the breasts are no longer swollen or tender from hormone elevations. We want to make sure that if the patient does not menstruate due to pregnancy or menopause, that they still continue to do self-breast examinations on the same day each month. Here is an example of doing a self-breast examination. The woman should be either sitting, standing, or in a shower. They should look at themselves and notice their breasts. Routinely, one breast is a, is a little or slightly larger than the other breast. They should put their hands on their hips and see if there's any changes in the breast tissue. They need to make sure that they palpate the breast tissue and using the fingertips 
of the opposite hand. This can be done in a circular motion beginning at the areola and moving in an outward positioning. This can be done in an up and down fashion, or it can be done from the areola outwards in direct specific movements. The largest part of the glandular tissue is in the upper outer quadrant for the female and in the tail of Spence for of each breast. When assisting or when palpating an individual's breast, we should support the patient's arm and palpate the axillary lymph nodes. This slide demonstrates how the chain of the clavicle lymph nodes are present in breast tissue. To perform a breast exam on a patient, the patient will lie flat with the arm extended and one hand under the head to help flatten the breast tissue evenly over the chest wall. Each breast is palpated in a systematic fashion. There are various methods of palpation of the breast. In A, it is a top to bottom in vertical strips. B shows concentric circles. And D is palpating from the center in wedge sections. Normal lymph nodes are not palpable. Each area needs to be assessed and note the number, consistency, mobility, and size of any lymph nodes that are palpable. One or two small, soft, non-tender palpable lymph nodes are normal. Abnormal palpable nodes will feel like a small mass that is hard, tender, and often Im immobile. They will feel like a firm, frozen pea. During palpation, the nurse should note the consistency of the breast tissue. Normal breast tissue feels dense, firm, and elastic. After menopause, the breast tissue will shrink and become softer. The lob lobular feel of glandular tissue is normal. The lower edge of each breast sometimes feels firm and hard, and this is a normal inframary ridge and not a tumor. Cancerous lesions are hard, fixed, non-tender, irregular in shape, and usually unilateral or one-sided. When assessing the male breast, the same technique is used to palpate for masses that is used in the female breast examination. Men who have first degree relatives, mother or sister with breast cancer are at risk for breast cancer and may be scheduled by their healthcare provider for a routine mammogram. When looking at the images, A is an anterior view of the abdomen that is divided into quadrants. B is the posterior view of the abdominal section. The examination of the abdomen is the assessment of the lower gastrointestinal or GI tract, liver, stomach, uterus and ovaries, kidneys and bladder. The abdominal pain is the most common symptom that is reported. The xiphoid process, or the tip of the sternum, is the upper boundary of the abdomen. The symphysis pubis is the lower boundary of the abdomen. When auscultating and inspecting the abdomen, it is divided into four um, quadrants at the midline, roughly the belly button. For an abdominal examination, we start with inspection, then we use auscultation. Palpation is always last 
when ex examining the abdomen because if palpation is attempted, it will alter both the frequency and the character of the individual's bowel sounds. When inspecting, we look at the skin of the abdomen first. We look for color variation, scars, venous patterns, lesions, and striae, which are stress marks, stretch marks. Scars reveal evidence of past traumas or surgeries that has created a permanent change. Bruising may indicate accidental injury, physical abuse, or a type of bleeding disorder. If needle marks or bruises are present, ask the patient if they self-administer any injections. Example would be low molecular weight heparin or insulin. Any unexpected findings would include generalized color changes such as jaundice or cyanosis. Shiny abdominal skin with a taut or a tight appearance can indicate ascites. A normal umbilicus is flat or concave with the same color skin as the surrounding abdominal area. The contour, symmetry, and surface motion, the nurse will note any masses, bulging, or distension. Peristalsis is the movement of the intestinal cont contents, and this is a normal function of the small and large intestines. Bowel sounds that are audible are passage of air and fluid that create the peristalsis. Normal air and fluid move through the intestines and create a soft gurgling or clicking sounds that occur irregularly anywhere from 5 to 35 times per minute. It routinely takes 5 to 20 seconds to hear a bowel sound. If you do not hear any bowel sounds, make sure to maintain your stethoscope for auscultation in the quadrant for five minutes before determining that the bowel sound is absent. The best time to auscultate for bowel sounds is between meals. Bowel sounds may be described as normal, audible, absent, hyperactive, or hypoactive. Absent bowel sounds indicate a lack of peristalsis, possibly late stage bowel obstruction, paralytic ileus, or peritonitis. Absent or hypoactive bowel sounds are normal after surgery following general anesthesia. Hyperactive bowel sounds are loud growling sounds called borborgmi. This indicates an increase in GI motility and may be caused by inflammation of the bowel, anxiety, diarrhea, bleeding, excessive ingestion of laxatives, or reaction of the intestines to certain foods. As a nurse, you will use light palpation over each abdominal quadrant to detect any areas of tenderness. You will use a systematic palpation for each quadrant and assess for muscular resistance, distension, tenderness, and superficial organs or masses. Aortic pulsation is a normal trans or normal pulsation that is transmitted forward. If the aorta is enlarged because of an aneurysm, the pulsation expands laterally. Do not palpate a pulsating abdominal mass. When conducting an abdominal assessment, the first skill a nurse puts to use is auscultation, inspection, palpation, percussion.
The answer is B. The order of the abdominal assessment is inspection, auscultation, percussion, if it is used, and palpation. Auscultation before palpation during the abdominal assessment is first because manipulation of the abdomen will alter the frequency and the intensity of the bowel sounds. Examination of female genitalia can be embarrassing, so the nurse needs to use a calm and a relaxed approach. A gynecologic examination is difficult for many adolescents. Depending on the cultural background, this may add to the individual's apprehension. The skin of the peritoneum should be smooth, clean, and slightly darker than other skin. Mucous membranes should appear pink and moist. Male genitalia include external and internal male sex organs. In these images, A is a circumcised male and B is an uncircumcised male. The nurse will note sexual maturity by observing the size and shape of the penis and testes, size, color, and texture of the scrotal skin, the character and distribution of pubic hair. Testes size will increase in pre-adolescence and there will be an absence of pubic hair. At the end of puberty, the testes and penis enlarge to adult size and shape. The scrotal skin darkens and becomes wrinkled. The hair becomes coarser and more abundant in the pubic area. The penis has no hair and the scrotum has very little hair. Men should perform a self-examination of their testicles each month. As a nurse, we teach men to look for swelling or lumps in the skin of the scrotum while looking in the mirror. Use both hands, place the index and middle fingers under the testes and the thumb on top. The man should gently roll the testicle, feel for lumps, swelling, soreness, or a harder consistency. They should find the epididymis, which is the cord-like structure on the top and the back of the testicle. They should feel for any small pea-sized lumps on the front and side of the testicle. Abnormal lumps are routinely painless. If the man has found any abnormalities, they need to contact their health care provider. For an examination of the rectum and anus, it will help detect colorectal cancer in early stages. The rectal examination also will assist in detecting prostatic tumors in men. For female patients, the dorsal recumbent position or the side-lying SIMS position is used. For male patients, they will bend forward with the hips flexed and the upper body resting on the examination table. For the musculoskeletal system assessment, we determine the range of joint motion, muscle strength and tone, joint and muscle condition. Assessing is important with reports of pain or loss of function in a joint or muscle. The patient should assume a sitting, supine, prone or standing position while assessing specific muscle groups. The nurse should observe the gait when the patient enters the room. Normal standing posture is upright with parallel alignment of the hips and the shoulders. Image A is an anterior view, B is a posterior view, 
and C is a lateral view. There are three common postural abnormalities. Kyphosis or hunchback is an exaggeration of the posterior curvature of the thoracic spine. This postural abnormality is common in older adults. Lordosis or swayback is an increased lumbar curvature. Lateral spine curvature is known as scoliosis. The loss of height is a first clinical sign of osteoporosis. Height loss occurs in the trunk as a result of the vertebral fracture and collapse. For musculoskeletal range of motion, you need to look at table 30.32 in your textbook. So when you're looking at the figures of the hands, A is range of motion of the hand and the wrist. It is a metacarp metacarpopharyngeal flexion and hyperextension. B is finger flexion, thumb to each fingertip to the base of the little finger. C is finger flexion, fist formation. D is finger abduction. E is wrist flexion and hyperextension. F is wrist radial and ulnar movement. All of the bones, joints, and muscles during a complete examination should be palpated. The nurse should note any heat, tenderness, edema, or resistance to pressure. The musculoskeletal examination includes comparison of both active range of motion and passive range of motion. Joints are routinely free from stiffness, instability, swelling, or inflammation. When assessing muscle tone, the nurse should support the extremity and grasp each limb moving it through the normal range of motion. Normal tone causes a mild, even resistance to movement throughout the entire range. Hypertonicity is when muscle has an increased tone, considerable resistance with any sudden passive movement of a joint. Continued movement eventually causes the muscle to relax. Hypotonicity is when the muscle has little tone and feels flabby. The involved extremity hangs loosely in a position determined by gravity. Atrophied muscle or muscle that is reduced in size will feel soft and boggy when palpated. What focused system assessment should Jane complete? Focused assessments include cardiovascular and peripheral vascular, respiratory, abdominal, which is GI and genital urinary, and integumentary. The three elements of these assessment include, for cardiovascular, blood pressure, heart rate, and auscultation of the heart. Peripheral vascular, inspection and palpation of extremities, peripheral pulses, edema, skin color and temperature, capillary refill of nail beds. For the respiratory system, it needs to be inspected, palpated, and auscultate the anterior, posterior, and lateral lung fields bilaterally. For the abdominal system, the it should be inspected and auscultated of the abdominal abdomen in all four quadrants. No palpation or percussion due to the abdominal surgery. The NG tube functioning should be checked. So 
for the NG tube, should, the suction should be turned off to assess the bowel sounds. And the abdominal dressing should be assessed for intactness and drainage. The Foley catheter should all be, also be assessed for functioning. The neurological system functions include initiation and coordination of movement, reception and perception of sensory stimuli, organization of thought processes, control of speech, and storage of memory. The nurse should observe mental and emotional status. The mini mental state examination, MMSE, is an instrument that measures orientation and cognitive functioning. The maximum score is 31, and scores of 21 or less will reveal cognitive impairment that requires further evaluation. Delirium is an acute mental disorder that occurs among patients who are hospitalized. It is characterized by confusion, disorientation, and restlessness. Often a sign of impending doom or underlying physical illness in older adults may be related to a serious injury, impaired senses, poor pain management, medications, or restraint use. Review table 30.35 and boxes 30.30 .30 and 30.31 in your textbook. For level of consciousness, the patient should be awake, alert, and oriented to person, place, time, and situation. The Glasgow Coma Scale is an objective measurement of consciousness on a numeric scale. The patient needs to be as alert as possible before initiating this test. The GCS or Glasgow Coma Scale allows evaluation of a patient's neurological status over time. The higher the score, the better the neurological functioning. The scores range from 3 to 15. Behavior, moods, hygiene, grooming, and choice of dress will reveal vital information about patient's mental status. The nurse must remain perceptive of a patient's mannerisms and actions during the entire physical assessment and note any nonverbal and verbal behaviors. The normal cerebral functioning allows an individual to understand spoken or written words and express their self through written words or gestures. The nurse should assess the patient's voice inflection, tone, and manner of speech. Normal patient's voice has inflections, is clear and strong, and increases in volume appropriately. Speech is fluent. Two types of aphasia are sensory or receptive and motor or expressive. Receptive aphasia is when a person cannot understand written or verbal speech. Expressive aphasia is when a person understands written and verbal speech, but cannot write or speak appropriately when attempting to communicate. These images show dermatomes of the body. These are body surface areas that are innervated by particular spinal nerves. Cervical one usually has no cutaneous distribution. Intellectual functioning includes memory, which is recent, immediate, and past, knowledge, abstract thinking, association, and judgment. 
The sensory pathway functioning includes sensations of pain, temperature, position, vibration, and crude and fine localized touch. Cranial nerves are in table 30.37 in the textbook and need to be understood and known. Motor function includes assessments that are made during the musculoskeletal examination. The nurse will also assess the patient's cerebellar functioning. The cerebellum coordinates muscular activity, maintains balance and equilibrium, and controls posture. Romberg's test is having a patient stand with feet together arms at the side, once with eyes open and once with eyes closed. The nurse will observe for any swaying. If the patient loses the balance, this indicates a positive Romberg test. Reflexes will assess the peripheral and spinal nerve functioning. This image is the pathway of a reflex arc. So reflexes assess the peripheral and spinal nerve functioning. Each muscle contains a small sensory unit called a muscle spindle to control the muscle tone and detect changes in the length of muscle fibers. Tapping a tendon with a reflex hammer stretches the muscle and the tendon lengthening the spindle. The spindle sends nerve impulses along afferent nerve pathways to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord segment. Within many seconds, impulses reach the spinal cord and synapses travel to efferent motor neurons in the spinal cord. A motor nerve sends impulses back to the muscle, causing reflex response. After the physical examination, validate any data that needs validation by the patient. Make sure that you record all data and report anything abnormal or suspicious to the primary care provider.